So Nolan, as a Neuralink user, and this you can imagine, let's say, in the future could be you if you have some sort of cyberware or some sort of other futuristic technology implanted in your brain. Nolan always has to calibrate his Neuralink implant. They have to always go on this app, which Neuralink produced. And again, this is a massive, again, touch point. If you are as a designer think, oh, I can design for this. Yes, you can, because there's going to be tools. Doesn't matter who you are. You could just be a product designer focusing on UI. So many use cases and so much you could help out Nolan for him to calibrate map research and things of that, or game basically with their machines. How I am able to control this computer. Everything is through this. This is where I do all of the daily tasks that I do with the team. This is the hub. This link app will be put on other devices, say phones or other things. Everyone would have this app and it would make those devices compatible with the Neuralink. For every action you, as a user, as a human, you plan to do something, you think about it, you execute it, and then you observe as a last bid, basically. Imagine if a scenario is that you work at a desk and you decide to listen to music. You might use a lot of interfaces. You might use a desk, you might use a mouse, you might use a keyboard, you might use the OS kernel and GUI or what you see on a screen. You might use some sort of apps, you might use a screen, a table, maybe even a mug. It's an interface, like everything is a product with an interface basically. And there is literally thousands of touch points around you at any given point, even as you watch this video. But let's just presume that the person with motor control decides to listen to the music. They look at the screen because they want to execute that space and they look for, let's say, something like Spotify Launcher. You basically have to look for it. Then their hand with a mouse moves on that trigger, which is another second of some sort of action. You know, it could be quicker, but basically if we split both steps, it would look like that. Then we would click on that trigger to unminimize, let's say, a Spotify app or open it. Then we would look for a trigger to resume playing the music. And that's the simplest journey. Then we would move a hand with a mouse on the trigger to play it. And then we would click a trigger to play the actual music. So there is micro steps involved or the steps to the actual journey, which requires both of your motor control with your peripherals, technology, but also arms or hands but also your visual cortex, hundreds or thousands of different systems are involved to make a simple execution and a simple playing of the music happen. Now with a BCI, that looks slightly different. So again, you would still have all the different interfaces, right? Like you might have limitations of them. Maybe it's very different, depends who you are. Maybe you are, let's say, if we take Nolan's with Neuralink example, they're quadriplegic, they're disabled neck down. Right. So they have, you know, a specific chair, they have other devices to support the movements or signaling or, you know, communication. There is a lot of other bits, maybe a bed, maybe something else. Basically, their interfaces expand. And if they have Neuralink enabled, they also have apps, which I'm going to show, and they have their laptop. They have many more devices around them. The challenge here is going to be a simplification as well. If let's say you are a designer in a BCI field, you're going to need to consider exactly how to simplify all of that and who is your user. Because to make it accessible, you're going to need to expand the systems and the touch points. But to make it good, you're also going to need to simplify and so forth. So there's going to be a balancing act between the affordances and feedback and the interaction touch points. And then the even bigger challenge is gonna be how to make it more commercial so absolutely anyone could use it. Anyhow, but the journey would be still the same. You would plan, you execute, and then you observe. The steps though would be different. You work at the desk, let's say, or maybe in your bed, decide to listen to the music, you look at the screen and find the trigger, e.g. Spotify launcher, and that's where your moving of the hand would be replaced with thinking about navigating to it. And as such, there is an immediate exchange with AI, which now analyzes, compares with the historical data, and then actions the actual move on a screen. The fastest possible conscious human reactions are around 0.15 seconds, but most are around 0.2 seconds. Unconscious or reflex actions are much faster around 0.08 seconds. So if you see some sort of Spotify song come up and you want to change it, that's the time it takes you to actually react. So let's say for me to change the tune 
or to change the music, it could take one second maybe of combined motor plus perceptive time, like the latency. Versus what happens with the actual Neuralink. That would so be you'll be able to play shooters like Call of Duty. Yeah, yeah, That's that brings up another thing. Like, I basically have an aimbot in my head. So, oh, yeah, so that's, probably, that's a big yeah, one. So probably have like different leagues uh, for people like me because it's just not fair. Um, wow, is it yeah. that accurate? It's that accurate and wow. it's and it's faster. One thing that I found with the Neuralink is something that uh, kind of blew my mind too is that when I'm attempting to do stuff sometimes or I'm thinking it to like move in a certain place, sometimes it's so good that it's moving before I even like think it to move. So it moves way quicker than the person would be like, oh yeah, I should click this. It kind of like immediately is based on, again, AI, conscious signaling, and a lot of other deep tech involved. How will BCI differentiate between you just thinking about listening to music and wanting to listen to music? The actual user has to train it. As I mentioned before, Nolan, they had to spend months using it for AI to adapt and know exactly what Nolan wants to do. And that's the beauty of AI and where it has the most value. And I cannot just overemphasize this enough. That's where the actual use cases are, where you have so many unstructured signals of me wanting to do X, Y, Z, and then doing it over time with a pool of historical data of millions of failed or successful answers or, or things which I want to do. And then in the end, AI learning, okay, this is what Nolan wants to do, or this is what I want to do in the end, and then responding to that. And obviously, your oversimplification of that is that Nolan's brain only uses the cursor. So it only replaces the mouse, that motor control, again, to coming to those journeys. Think about it this way. It's another way to interact with a cursor for Matthew now. Nagel was paralyzed from the neck down after being stabbed several years ago but technology gave him hope. He was one of four testing BrainGate, a new technology where a chip is implanted in the brain that picks up electrical impulses. A computer then interprets those impulses as actions. Here's Matthew playing a computer game. He's not using a mouse or a joystick, rather he's thinking of where to move the paddle. All thoughts are electrical impulses, and after extensive research and testing, a computer has been trained to decode those impulses and create the corresponding Perfect action. example of what we discussed and probably answers Alien's question of like, how do you differentiate? It doesn't really differentiate. You just train enough and do enough repetitions as a user. Now, I wanted to bring this up too because the brain gate was done in 2004, so two decades ago. Now, this is super invasive because as you can see, the actual electrodes still stick out from the head. So it obviously restricts the actual user. You still need even more touch points more of those interfaces around you to kind of maintain and be careful of. That's how the big of the delta is between this state and what the Neuralink did. And I think it's a fascinating case because you just realize exactly what the steps were to actually get to this in the last century. Let me just flip the camera on so you can see what uh, Nolan's been doing. Yeah. Let me come over here. Do you want to explain a little bit what's going on here? Yeah, I love playing chess. And so this is one of the things that y'all have enabled me to do, something that I wasn't able to really do much the last few years. My right hand, left, right, forward, back. And um, from there, I think it just became intuitive for me to start imagining the cursor moving. It was like uh, using the force on a cursor <laughs> and I could get it to move wherever I wanted, just stare somewhere in the screen and it would move where I wanted it to. I mean, my mind is blown, but you know, I can just imagine what they feel and how their mind exploded with the possibilities of what they are now able to do. So many use cases and so much you could help out Nolan for him to calibrate map research and things of that or game basically a fair machine. I think app is how I am able to control this computer. Everything is through this. This is where I do all of the daily tasks that I do with the team. This is the hub for everything. I imagine this is how for the future when implants are in more people or just with me, I guess, this link app will be put on other devices, say with phones or other things. Everyone would have this app and it would make those devices compatible with the Neuralink. 
So right here, these are like all the devices that this is connected to, that the Neuralink is connected to. This is Eve, my implant, which I named. You can see clear indicator that the actual implant is connected. So there is always a feedback for them to know that, you know, everything is good. You can also see the battery life, which obviously Nolan is responsible for as a user to charge in their day, in their journey, so that it's always up. I think the personalization here is also pretty cool because obviously even Nolan said themselves that he did name it Eve, which kind of sparks that ownership for him to take care of it, to not drop the research, to actually train on it, calibrate it, basically use it daily because it's his Eve implant basically it belongs to him it's part of him it kind of has to be like his tamagotchi and i think that probably is not done um consciously by Neuralink team but if i would be a ux designer on there that's my thinking why i would have added that so kudos to the actual product team from Neuralink, because they obviously maybe inadvertently added it they maybe didn't even know about it other two things are the chargers for my implant. This is the calibrate section. This is what I'm talking about because every time Nolan has to use it, he has to go and calibrate the Neuralink. Obviously, because of a lot of physical factors, you know, the brain waves change, the signals change. There is a massive scarification as well in the brain because it's healing. It's basically trying to obviously reject the things which don't belong there. Something that I do in order to give me control of the cursor. Basically, it's the process of the Link app, learning what my brain signals, like learning to map my brain signals and like keyboard control. So I would go into the calibration, I would do that, and then I would get the control that I have right now with the cursor. That started out basically version one was a lot different than where it's at now that's really important too he knows that he's part of a research team and every version is improving with him in fact i think in this video shortly you're gonna see that they created some apps specifically for his interactions which we're obviously going to use for people going forward so because no one is number one test subject or you know participant more people who are going to come in are obviously going to use the tools which they designed for Nolan. And what did they use? Obviously, they did some agile product design and development, a lot of user research, consistent engagement with the actual person, with a human being to understand what they need, not just what they want, but what they need, and then giving them applets and add-ons and so forth. And at this point, I'm able to do it basically completely on my own before I would be doing it in sessions with the Neuralink people and they would have to run the whole thing and we tried out a hundred different ways of doing it. This is not, I would say, the best model that I've ever had. The model is whatever the cursor control is that I have when I come out. It will update throughout the process and it'll be a lot better with more time. And I think it's great that he kind of mentions it. So he doesn't just gloss over it. Hey, I got that implant in six hours and I was capable to do all of this. Like he obviously stresses it enough. And I'm sorry, I'm putting the user researcher's hat and kind of taking it in. <laughs> like if I would have been doing interview right now, I'd be no making so many notes that, okay, this was like a big demand for the user. He literally spent months daily trying to work with it to change that model as he mentioned. This is not a version one of it. And the longer I stay in, generally the better it'll become. So I can stay in there for 30 minutes, an hour or more if I wanted to. And hopefully the cursor would be, cursor control would get even better. I also can do what we call like body mapping. This one is like right arm pushes. So you'll see like a right arm on screen and I will follow the visual to map what my intention is and they tell me what they want me to do, basically. Neuralink created games to help calibrate, but also train the actual users. Like Nolan here, let's say he's using this web grid game. It is addicting. This number over here will climb as I get more targets for every minute. See the red when I miss. This is basically how we test if the model is very good. This number goes up basically as high as we want it to but I think I use like a 35 is like the most, the highest we go, anything over than that isn't super great. The targets are pretty small. UX.
right? The area of a touch has to be big enough because otherwise he might miss. And his quote too is that sometimes it moves even before he decides to move and intentionally so because you don't have to go through those motor control uh, loops and latency and everything in between. It's kind of like he thinks just I should move there and it's already there basically. For you actually see a great future since all the interactions are changing. If you're focusing just on apps or digital products in, ahead of you, still there's going to be so many use cases where your skills are required. It might be hardware, it could be digital, it could be software, it could be all in between. It should excite you because your information architecture skills, your research skills, the empathy, understanding user psychology, how do you research with a person like Nolan, how do you express an idea of how to solve those tiny problems for him is, is a massive one. If he can move the cursor and activate it, he can basically do everything you could do on your phone with your thumb. It's exactly the same thing or if your mouse on a laptop you know you could get a virtual keyboard and then basically work he's learning japanese as well so he's using simple web apps and interfaces available to absolutely everyone but he's able to interact with that just by thinking I know that i'm not very good no need to tell me twice Let's see what else i don't know if you guys can tell my cursor control is not as fast as i would want it to be it's kind of not as smooth as i would want it to be so there are a couple things i can do one is this mixer which they've given me control of at the beginning i would basically have to ask them for all sorts of help if something was wrong i could like have to wait around or just deal with it or just not use it at all now i have this little mixer and what this does is gives me a bit more control over how this cursor interfaces so the gain right here is basically speed so i'm at 2.4 right now if i keep going up this cursor is just going to get faster and faster which i am a fan of it'll help me move across the screen a lot easier the friction down there at the bottom is well it's exactly what it sounds like it's friction keeps it slower maybe keeps me over targets a bit better and so i'll turn that down because i feel like it's slowing me down a little there we go personalization again an ability for him to for him to just self-serve and customize his experience is massive because different games obviously like the tiny grid requires more friction and precision to adapt right like or like adjust the game if a strategy game which i think there is a demo too like you obviously want more spatial ability to kind of browse through basically the landscape or to quickly shift the things kind of you need that responsiveness he's the one who's basically streaming and setting this up he doesn't have to have anyone else as long as he calibrates his cursor and he calibrates the technology with his responses and thinking he's able to basically do everything anyone else would be able to do he would be able to stream like i'm streaming now and it took me so long to set it up physically every time it does because there are so many inputs that's absolutely amazing because if he thinks he can just jump into it and do it but everyone else's life can become the same way he mentioned that could take like 15 or 20 years for this to be commercialized as alien says on the chat speechless me too you know besides sharing what this is as a result it's absolutely amazing at some point all of this becomes so operationalist where he can do a lot and he knows how to do it he knows the limits the extent every day he can do that research or help out researchers and neuraling and and do what he wants to do either play games or train his brain or like you know chat with his friends i didn't show in a demo but he's able to pull up the software keyboard just like you would on um, accessibility controls on your machine and type letter by letter with his brain basically by thinking so that's another way to interact he's basically much more connected with his surroundings and able to do what he wants to do but there is obviously another side to the coin which is that there is effective hardware decline phase or something i would call effective hardware decline phase but hardware not that neural link is becoming worse over time it's that the biology is limiting this and this is going to be a massive challenge for anyone because you as a uxer or human experience designer of source or producer you need to consider that there is a half-life to this and at some point that half-life is reached and the rest is going to be a slow decline and from the podcast of nolan he feels like he reached that he reached the peak of the experience and there is a decline in the feedback in the you know how it 
it works, it basically gradually becomes worse and worse. Granted, the AI can sense that. If the hardware declines and let's say your brain gets scarified, it's harder and harder to get those signals for AI to do something about it. And it doesn't matter how much you train on AI, it's like it's like a continuous battle, you know, for survival ultimately to do this. It's again, step number one in so many different steps to come.